Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com. Spread around these two tables are all the major components that came from a 2016 Yamaha YXZ1000R. I had everything sent off to the machine shop to see if it was going to be up to the task for a turbo build. Now to do that, there are several things that we're going to need to modify and upgrade so this engine will hold together. So let's step over to the table and let me show you the parts that we've chosen for this build. All right, guys, laying on this table are the meat and potatoes going to be required for this build. Now, there will be other parts that will probably end up having to order. I mean, come on, it's an engine rebuild. There's going to be other pieces that I'm going to find once I go inside that I'll have to get ordered. But what you see on the table is what's going to be absolutely necessary to make this a turbo engine. Now, the biggest focal point of this engine build is really centered around reducing the compression ratio and I decided to go with the Wisco piston. It's an exceptional build quality, brings it down to 9.5 to 1 compression ratio and each one of their piston kits, you get the piston, you get the rings, you get the circlips, you get the wrist pins, everything that you're going to need to get it connected to the connecting rod. Now combined with that, this is an older engine that we're working with. It originally came out of a 2016, so its weak point were the connecting rods. So we're updating the connecting rods with ones from a 2019 engine. That should be more than enough to deal with it. Now beyond that, I went ahead and got just the basic gaskets that I know I'm going to have to replace, and especially the output seal. One last thing that I want to mention, but I can't show you the part numbers yet, is I'm going to be replacing both the main and the connecting rod bearings on the crankshaft itself. But I won't know which ones to order until I actually get to the numbers on both the block and the crankshaft itself. Those numbers will determine which ones I need to order. More on that later. Well, now that I at least have a starting point with all of our parts, let's get over there and start putting this engine together. Step number one, let's go ahead and attach the piston to the connecting rods. Now to do that, you want to have your orientation of the connecting rod with the Y facing to your right and your arrow on your piston facing up. So this is what, where we're going to end up. Arrow up and the Y on each connecting rod to my right. This is going to be just a typical installation of a circlip. You want to make sure that the ends are not in this little cutout. I usually put them about 3 o'clock just above it, and then we'll walk it in with our fingernails. And it's important as you're doing this not to let it scratch. All right, and all we're doing here is just using the screwdriver to get that last little bit in there. Okay, next. Let's get some assembly lube where the wrist pin's going to be going. Let's get our wrist pin started. Our arrow is facing up. The Y is to our right. In she goes. Now let's get on our second circlip. Now I usually put a screwdriver or a pick and just shift it back and forth a couple of times just to make sure it's seated all the way in. Let's go back and do that to the other side. Good to go. Now going forward, this is going to be piston number one and I'm going to label the other ones as well because when I go back and check the gap, that's going to be important, but more than that, the bearing sizes, which I'll show you how to do that later. One down, two more to go. Same process. Let's get this table shifted out of the way and start checking our ring gap. But before you start in the assembly, you need to go through yourself and make sure that there's no residual left on any of the surfaces. So let's do a little bit more cleaning before we start checking the ring gap. 
Now typically I just use brake cleaner, but Yamaha has a great product, especially when it comes to cleaning the internals. It's actually a PPC precision parts cleaner. It's a little bit step above just a regular brake cleaner. So we're getting ready to gap our rings, but with the Weiss Cove pistons, they run a little bit tighter tolerances than the Yamaha. Now for the Yamaha, you'd be looking at 0.5 millimeters for the top ring and 0.7 millimeters for the second ring. Now, with the Weiss code, like I said, they're a little bit tighter tolerances. We're going to be looking at 0.33 millimeters for your top ring and 0.406 millimeters for the second ring. So you want to keep that in mind when you're setting the ring gap because it is a little bit different compared to the Yamaha. Now included with each piston, Weissco has a chart that shows you how to calculate the ring gap. Now for this particular application, we're going to use your bore, convert it over to inches, and then multiply that number times 0 .004. So what you ended up with was 3.15 times 0 .004, which is 0 .0126 inches. You round that up to 0 0.013, and that translates to 0.33 millimeters. So, let's get in our top ring and see if anything needs to be adjusted. We're starting with cylinder number one, and I typically bring them in a little bit past the wrist, about midway. That should do it. Well, let's get our 0.33 millimeters. Let's see where we ended up. She just barely goes in there, but it doesn't grab it. So as usual, the Weiss goes right on the money. Let's take a look at our second ring. So we're at 0.4. Mm -hmm. So we are good to go. Now I'm just going to repeat that process for cylinders two and three just to make sure. I'm not really concerned about exactly what the gap is because it's not like I can add material, but it's very important that it not be smaller than this. Otherwise, as the rings expand, they don't have room to expand, and then they start damaging your cylinder wall. So that's why ring gap and checking your ring gap is so important. A little too much, okay. A little too little, not okay. Now, if you followed the specification for the Yamaha measurements, you would have to file these down and you'd be making a mistake. So it's important to follow the Weissco recommendations. Next, let's work on ring placement. Now, according to the Weissco manual, they want the top ring in line with the wrist pin here, the second ring 180 degrees on this side, your oil expander here, and then your oil top and bottom here and here. So let's go ahead and start with the oil. Now you want to make sure that your oil expander ring doesn't overlap. So in other words, we want this end to be butted together just like this. Let's go for the bottom. That's on the bottom, now well, let's get the oil top. Next, let's go to our second ring. Before we put it on, we just want to get a little bit of oil and just lightly wipe it down. That's all it takes. And since your hands are already oily, go ahead and hit that top ring as well. Next, let's go with our second ring. We want to make sure this little end is facing up. Now, if you don't want to damage your fingers like I'm doing, of course, you can use a ring expander tool, make your life a little bit easier. If you're doing it with your fingers like I am, just try not to scratch as you're bringing the edges down. Now, let's get our top ring. And you only want to spread it apart the minimum distance. 
Otherwise, you'll be ordering a new set. Next, let's put a little bit of oil on the piston, especially on the, on the skirt. And for this, I'm going to be using a piston ring compressor from Weissco. We'll go ahead and oil it up as well. These things work amazingly. All right, that's prepped and ready to go. Let's go ahead and take our end cap off. The bolts are a 12 millimeter, and I'll go ahead and tell you, if you get these from Yamaha, they're already going to be torqued, so you'll probably need a vise with a soft grip to hold them still to get them to remove. Now, before we pop this in, let's go ahead and talk about our bearing sizing. Now, on the end of your crankshaft, you're going to have a set of numbers. The first set here, that is your P1, P2, P3, but keep in mind, P1 is this location, that is P2, and then that is P3. Now these other four, those are for your main journals, and we'll talk about that sizing later. So as we've got it laid out here, the numbers on the end were 433, P1, P2, P3. And all you're doing is looking at the end of your connecting rod, you're gonna find a number on it. What you're looking for is a number on the side right here. In this case, it's six. As a matter of fact, all three of mine have the number six. So all you're doing is taking six minus the P1, two, or three, then that's gonna give you a number. In my case, it's gonna be two, three, three for P1, P2, P3. And that translates into a black, brown, brown. And that's what I have laid out here. So let's put our crankshaft back to the side and get our bearings put in. Make sure our surfaces are clean. There it is. Let's put a little bit of oil on the cylinder walls. Now before we put this in there, let's use a little bit of fuel line just to cover that up so it doesn't even touch the cylinder walls. And our arrow is going to point toward the exhaust and we're going to pop it in. doing this, make sure you've got the ring compressor all the way down flush. There she goes. One down, two more to go. Same process. Everybody's in place. Let's get it turned over and then we'll address the crankshaft bearings. It spun around not only this direction, but also this direction. So number one is still on my left, going one, two, three, left to right. But before we can place the crankshaft in there, I need to go ahead and place in the bearings for it. And I've also sized those as well. So now is as good a time as any to share with you how to choose yours for your particular application. As we noted earlier, we use these three digits to determine our connecting rod bearing size. These over here, those are our main bearing size reference numbers. So ours are 3443. Four, four, three. Now the other bit of information that we need is actually stamped on the block itself. The number we're looking for, or numbers we're looking for, are right here. But you'll notice that there's only one stamped. And when that happens, that means that all four numbers are the same. And in this case, it's six. So the equation we're going to be using is J1 crankcase minus J1 crankshaft web plus two. And that's going to give the value that we're looking for. And in our case, J1 is going to be six minus three plus two equals five. And that translates to a yellow bearing size. J2 and J3 
are both the same. And in that case, it's gonna be six minus four plus two equals four, which makes them both green. Now J4, it is the same as J1, so that's gonna be a, another yellow bearing. Now let's go ahead and wipe it down one more time. I mean, I'm sure this block is clean, but a little bit extra never hurt. So let's go ahead and get those in place. And I'm just, I'm just gonna pop them in. Now when we're measuring with plastic gauge, we wanna make sure everything is dry. We will go back later and add the assembly lube. Right now, it needs to be a dry fit. All I'm doing now is just placing a little bit of plastic gauge on the connector rod bearing caps. We'll do it this way then. Gravity was trying to work against me. And our number is gonna be facing toward me. Now to get it torqued, we do this in two segments. The first, we take it down to 15 foot pounds, and on the final, we're gonna change our units to degrees and take it to 120. Now the safest way to do this is to do them one at a time because if it rotates as we're going through this procedure, it's game over. So we'll torque it down one at a time, remove it, make sure it's right, and then go to the next one. I am going three, two, one, but don't let that bother you. So let's remove it and see what we've got. I can go ahead and tell you, I have yet to build a Yamaha engine, whether it be power sports or marine, where I had to adjust. But hey, you don't know unless you check. Maybe this will be the first time I have to adjust the thickness. All right, we want it in between 13 and 20 thousandths, or rather 0.032 to 0.05 millimeters. And that looks dead in the middle. Maybe a tick over 0.038. So as I said, dead on. But we're gonna go through the process, check the other two just to make sure, and then we'll go forward. All right guys, I just wanna tell you, when you're doing this, take your time, Keep everything straight. I don't think you want to have to go back and do this again, do you? <laughs> or two bearings get swapped. That would not be a, a good outcome. You can look at the three now. P1, P2, P3. They're all equal, so we're good to go. What we need to do now is get this cleaned off, but before we can go any further with the crankshaft, we need to get the counterbalance in place because Without it there, you can't get it in. It, it has to go in first, so let's go ahead and knock that out. Let's start by getting this bearing down on the end. The trick is here to make sure you drive it in straight. Otherwise, you're gonna be here for a while. There she goes. Let's get our gear down in place. All right, so the real trick here is when we're feeding the main shaft through, this gear needs to go on, but it has to be held in place as you're pushing the, the counterbalance shaft through. Now you'll notice that there's a channel right here, and then you will see a dowel on the shaft itself, and that's where it needs to line up. So let's get our gear in place. There we go. Now on the other end, we have a needle bearing and then a washer that goes on the back side of it. Now we never removed that inner race on this end, so we're good to go. Now on this end, there's a retention plate for the torques. And my philosophy is if it's on the inside of the engine, for the most part, I'm gonna use Loctite, just to be sure. Before we get that gear and counterweight put on the end, we're going to carefully tilt it a little bit and hold it in place and get some assembly lube on this bearing. You'll see that I've marked, see this little flat section? 
that needs to line up with that dot on the counterbalance. I mean, this has to go in that position. Otherwise, guess what? It's not going to be balancing anything. It'll be out of balance. So that's where we need to end up. And we're just going to put this end bolt in finger tight. Once we get the other end put together, then we'll come back and torque both of them one at a time. But now it's held in place. Now let's get this other bearing pressed in. And then we have a uh, circlip that holds it in place. We want our sharp edge facing out. All right. Now this one, I've marked it as well. You can see where that it's notched in on that particular one. Now that is going to line up with that dot here. Then here comes the counterbalance. It has a dot here and it's going to line up there. Now you can see it. Now we're just going to put this end bolt in finger tight and then We'll get the crankshaft back in there and do the final torque on the connecting rod bearings. All right, there is our dot. And I'm just adding a mark to it so it's easier to see in there. And that point on the crankshaft is going to line up with this point, which I've marked on the end of this tooth. Okay, here comes the fun part. <laughs> Okay, let's get our end caps on and get them torqued. Now, before we put the, the bolts on there, let's put a little bit of oil on the threads and on the base. So that initial 15 foot pounds of torque is really accurate before we do the angle. Okay, we're good to go. Let's get some torque on those bolts. We're going to go 15 across the board and then go back and do the 120 on each one. So now let's do our angle. 120 is what we're going for on each one. When you're dealing with lower torque values, you want to sneak up on it slowly so you're more accurate. All right, guys and girls, that is feeling really good. Believe it or not, Yamaha says to put a piece of wood somewhere to keep it from turning. And so I think they're talking about just a piece of wood in between here and here. I don't have one, so I'm using a piece of steel bar just wrapped up. And then we're gonna to torque it down to 25 foot pounds. There we go. Get the other side. All right. Last but not least, we just need to come back and bend the tabs in to secure the bolt in place. This side might be a little bit tougher to do. I got it. While we're at it, let's go ahead and get this bearing on the end of our crankshaft Let's go ahead and get some assembly lube in there. This is one that has a indention here. We just need to line it up with that dowel in the back. Now with that in place, let's go ahead and get our bearings into our lower half of the crankcase. What I need now are the dowels. One there and one there. All right, guys, if you were either replacing your crankshaft and or your block, of course, you'd go through the same sizing procedure that I did earlier, and then you'd come up with a determination for what bearings go where, and then you would plastic gauge it just to make sure. 
I did not change the block and we did not change the crankshaft. So it is safe to say that we can go back with the same size bearings that came out of it and that's what I'm gonna do. But I already walked you through the procedure of how to check it on the connector rods. It's the same thing. You just install the case, use your old bolts, because remember those primary ones are one use only. Take a measurement and then you're good to go. I feel confident I can skip over that step. Got my dowels in place, gonna lay down a bead of sealant and then we're gonna put this case together. The Yamaha manual calls out Yamaha Bond 1215. I prefer using three bond. My weapon of choice is the 1211. Difference in between this and the, uh, the 1215, 1215 is gray. This is white. So, but it's the same stuff. And you do not need to get carried away with this. Just a thin strip is all that you need to do. Because actually putting too much opens up the excess going inside the engine and stopping up your oil passageways. So it's one of those cases where too much of a good thing is bad. Okay, let's close her up. All right, bolts one through eight. Get oil on the threads as well as the surface area where the washers come in contact with the head of the bolt. And remember these were the new ones. Now the rest of them we're gonna put in, they can be reused. Now we're gonna hand start each one of these a couple of turns at least. And then I'm gonna use an impact just to seat them. Just to seat them. <laughs> very lightly so I don't wear out my hands just getting these bolts seated. All right I'm laying these out like they're showing in the list. The silver ones are oil, the black ones get Yama Bond. So this is 9, 10, and 12. There's 11. Made one mistake. You can tell that this one was supposed to be on the outside. So this is 15, 19, 20. So now we got 16, 17, 18 are the black ones. 13, 14, 21, 22, 24. And 23 is this one oddball right there. So now all the bolts are in the right place. Now we just need to go through the torque sequence. All right, the way we're gonna do this is one through eight, you take each one of them down to 11 foot pounds. Now we're gonna go back, loosen them, take them back to 11 foot pounds, one at a time. Then one through four is gonna go to in between 95 and 100 degrees and then five through eight goes in between 75 and 80 degrees. Those were the most important ones, but now we just need to finish out the perimeter, get it torqued down in sequence. Nine through 12, we're taking those to 17 foot pounds. Now the rest of them, 13 through 24 is 8.7 foot pounds. That's it, the rotation assembly is together and sealed up. So before we get carried away with all the oil pump and the chain and everything else, it is important to go ahead and install your cam chain. Next, do not forget that large dowel. You've got new O-rings that need to go in place. Now here's where you need three hands. The trick here is bring up your oil gear and make sure that that 4XV is pointing toward the pump. We're gonna hold that in place as we bring in the oil pump. Make sure you've got your dowels in place. All right, they're in. And we're gonna turn our pump to where it lines up. There we go. Personal preference, 
a little bit of Loctite on the end of this bolt. Let's bring them all in and seat them, and then we'll get them torqued down. Double check, make sure your O-ring is in its groove where it should be, and not protruding out. All right, guys, as we go along, there are going to be several parts that were not on the table. And as we go through this, we'll pop it up on the screen. But if you miss it, you can find it in a link in the description below. 8.7 foot-pounds for all of these. Now let's get this oil gear bolt tightened down. Of course, Yamaha has a holder for it that they call out. I'm just going to use this one, actually, for my marine side. But whatever you can get in there to hold those, hold the sprocket still, it'll be fine. It's only 11 pounds, so it won't take much. Honestly, probably just could have put a screwdriver right here and done it that way. Or a quarter-inch extension. That would have held it going straight through. And you're not talking about a lot of torque here, so <laughs> whatever you need to do to hold that, hold that still. So all torqued down, that's good to go. Let's get a couple more dowels and then get our oil pan mounted. Get our gasket in place. Blows my mind how um, Yamaha uses sealant for just about everything, but not this. <laughs> now it is time to close it up. You've got uh, three different bolts. Let's get them all bottomed out. And there is a torque sequence, but it's not that complicated. Nothing like the crankcase. All of them are 7.2 foot-pounds, but there is a certain order that Yamaha wants you to go in. And then our oil drain bolt. All right, the, the sequence is these two on the end, the black ones. Number two is going to be the oil drain bolt. And then three, you can do the rest of them. Right, check these. Good to go. While we are here, let's go ahead and put this little retention or guide in. And as usual, they don't require it, but I recommend a little bit of Loctite. And I think we can safely torque this particular thread to 7.2. Next, let's get our chain guides installed. I recommend a little bit of Loctite. Blue Loctite, that is. We're going to take these to 7.2. Now we'll bring in our flywheel. Make sure you've got your washer in place, which we do. Make sure your key is in place. Then just line it up with those teeth and on she goes. Next, we're going to put some oil on both the washer, the bolt, and the threads. And we're going to torque it. 94 foot-pounds once we put a holder on there. This is going to be fun. Let's see what we can get. 55. 84. <laughs> there she is. Let's go ahead and do the... Uh, the flywheel stator. Yeah, I've got the, uh, the gas cleaned off. Takes forever. Hate doing it. Wish there was something easier. There's not. So let's get our gasket in place. Just be careful because those magnets are going to be pulling in and potentially can uh, pinch your finger. So just be ready for it. Like I said. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And they look to be all the same size, but there's three with washers on them, and you've got little arrows to show you which ones those are. Now this clip or holder is that one. I just don't see yet what wiring it's going to be holding in place yet. Something else is coming through there. I guess that'll uh, become apparent when we 
get the intercooler mounted or the oil cooler mounted because that's what goes over on this side. I'll take all these to 8.7. I guess we can go ahead and put these in for the time being. Don't forget your O ring, a little bit of silicone to make life easier. And get our pipe in there. We're finished up on this side. Let's move to the other because there's a bearing we need to replace before we put the output flange on there. Next, that's not going back in like that. That's, that's a little bit ugly. Sounds a little crunchy. So we gotta do something about that. Let's get our snap ring off. Excessive how far I'm having to pull it. And then it's a little bit of playing operation because it's twisting. Note to self, get bigger pliers. <laughs> that was fun. Can't wait to put it back on there. Okay, let's get our seal removed, but take note of where it is pushed into. So this is one of the main seals and you would be crazy not to replace this if you're this far into the engine because this one wasn't leaking but I'm extremely surprised that it wasn't. So it was actually caught. It made it past the seal but didn't make it past this o-ring. Just strange to have uh, rust that low down in the engine. But we do have to clean this up once we press that other bearing out. Yeah, listen to that. Not good. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get a, take it over to the press and get it pushed out of there. Voila. Just a matter of getting it cleaned up now. Well guys, it was a combination of a little bit of wire wheel, then a little bit of brush in the uh, parts washer, and a whole lot of contact cleaner, and then some lapping compound on the back side of emery cloth to clean this up. I'm happy enough with the surface to where I think it's gonna reseal and not leak. So let's head over to the press, get that bearing pressed in, and then get it put back together. Now that we've got the bearing pressed in, we're also gonna use the press to put in the seal because it has to be set at a particular depth. And that's kind of hard to do with just a regular you know, hammer using it to push it in. So we're gonna use the press to more accurately get it at the correct depth. Just make sure whatever you're using, it goes as close as you can get it to this outside edge without going past it. looking for, other than just eyeballing it, is an installed depth of in between five and five and a half millimeters from this upper edge. So let's see what we've got. I went just a little bit over at 5.7. Guess what? I'm going to call that good. Plus, by moving it a little bit further in, it's going to ride differently on the shaft where it was actually worn. So I'm okay with that. Let's get some assembly lube in here. Get some grease around that seal. Tell you what, we're gonna add some more on here. Now. Get our circlet back down. Last but not least, new O-ring. A little grease around that edge to make it easier to slide back in. 
putting a little bit more grease inside of the crankcase halves as well because I want that o-ring to go in smooth. All right guys, let's go in. Make sure that o-ring goes in all the way around. All right, we bottomed out on the crankshaft, so now we need to use our flange mounting bolts to go ahead and pull the housing all the way in. A couple of turns on each one to pull it in evenly. We're going to take those to 8.8 .8 or 9 foot-pounds. Now some oil on our main bolt and on the head of it. We're just going to bottom it out, then put on our flywheel. Then we'll have to hold the flywheel to tighten this bolt. And just be careful when you're getting it to lay flush. It may take a little bit of rocking it back and forth before it finally seats in. Don't force it with the bolts. You want it completely flush before you start tightening those down. All right, guys, we've got the flywheel mounted up. All our bolts are in place. Now it's time to get it torqued. We've got our holder in place, and we're about to take that center bolt to 87 foot-pounds. There we go. We'll leave the holder on there and then go back and hit all six of these mounting bolts to 27. So we've got this torque down. Next, let's go ahead and pop on our starter. And I was looking at our threads and we're going to use a chaser to clean them out because it looks to be a pretty good bit of corrosion. We're going to take care of that before we mount it up. Now, if you do have threads that need to be cleaned, resist the temptation of using just a tap and die set. It can get it done, but it's not the correct way to do it. You'll end up damaging your threads. Now, if you want more information on this product, we have a video that actually addresses what I'm using versus using just a tap and die set and why you should not use a tap and die set to do what I just did. Okay, let's go. I'm gonna put some grease around that O-ring to help seal it, but more importantly, make it easier to get in there. And third, if you ever have to remove this again, this is a place where corrosion loves to build up and makes it very difficult to extract. That's it. And these are just 12 millimeter bolts. Now, so make it a little bit easier. I'm gonna rotate the engine a little bit to get the uh, water pump on. All right, let's get our old O-rings out. Install our new ones. There we go. Now what's the chances it's going to stay in place when I bring it over there? All right, well, let's find out. Let's get our blind plug. Make sure you've got your O-ring in place. And I've got a little bit of silicone spray on mine to make it easier to pop in place. Now we can bring over the water pump assembly. Now the trick here is we may have to jog this one way or another to get these teeth to line up. But don't get carried away because remember we've got a timing chain that's just kind of hanging out here. We don't want to bind it up and damage it. Four longs, leave three short ones. taking those to 8.7 foot-pounds. That one tucked up in there, I'd have to take the flywheel off. So guess what? I'm gonna use just a regular handle and my internal torque wrench. Now through the magic of editing, you will hear the beep there. <laughs> 
All right, guys, that is going to wrap up at least the bottom end of this engine. Uh, we still have to put the old cooler on this side, but I'm going to save that for a little bit later. We're going to go ahead and cover this up so we can turn our attention to building up the head. Well, listen, if you have any questions about this video, why don't you leave them in the section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And hey, if you like what you see, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you can keep up with whatever I'm working on next. We just want to say thank you for shopping here with us at Parkzilla, and we will see you in the next video.